This is our last part of our lecture on general principles of orthopedic trauma. Uh, so we're going to just finish up talking a little bit about pediatric fractures, just real basic principles. So the first thing is there are anatomic differences. Um, the bones are still growing. Um, uh, there are uh, unossified uh, centers of uh, bone that uh, uh, if you look at an x-ray, it looks like there's no bone there, but it's actually there. It's just cartilaginous at that point and has uh, not ossified. Uh, the shapes of uh, some of the bones can be uh, different. The blood supply in certain areas can uh, be a little bit different. Um, so without going into too much detail, there are some anatomic differences. Um, there are growth implications, which you don't have in an in the adult per se. That is, when you're addressing a fracture in a child, um, that is a bone that is typically going to continue growing. It depends what age they are. Uh, now that has implications also with remodeling. So younger children typically will remodel a lot more um, and uh, a fracture can potentially have a little bit more deformity and still remodel and straighten itself out, whereas an adolescent may not have much growth remaining. Um, so that the growth implications can cut both ways. And there are legal implications. You're dealing with uh, children potentially um, um, uh, with injuries caused by non-accidental trauma and children who cannot speak. Um, and um, so it is something to be aware of. So you can't really talk about uh, children's fractures without uh, talking about the growth plate, right? Or growth plate, and we'll get into growth plate fractures. The growth plate, also known as the physis, is where new bone grows. So if you were to take an x-ray of a child, this um, femur here, you would actually see, you know, like a gap there, and maybe here, uh, and maybe here. These are growth centers. The um, distal femur is, is, is right there. So it may look like a little undulating fracture line, or on a, on a plain radiograph, the bone looks... Uh, white and these may be black lines, right? Um, and then when they're an adult, that that those things close up and you 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 don't really see a gap there anymore. So what's in that gap? Well, again, it's not there's a gap. It's not that there's a there's nothing there. It's it's a unossified cartilage. So this is just a histologic view of uh, the growth plate. And there are these four zones: reserve zone, zone of proliferation, zone of hypertrophy and then the zone of provisional ossification. Okay, and that you can shows you anatomically where this is um, in the bone. So you do need to know about Salter-Harris classification. Um, so the Salter-Harris classification is the most commonly used classification for growth plate fractures. So let's say if this is a, um, I don't know, uh, distal femur, um, a, a fracture that involves only the growth plate uh, and could be displaced, could be separated. Uh, you could have uh, this epiphysis uh, sitting over here, but uh, there's no fracture into the epiphysis or up into here, so it's a type 1 fracture as opposed to um, growth plate is here, okay? And there's a similar image, or this image may be in your, I'm sorry, misdrew that, in, in your textbook, uh, in the, princip uh, the AOS principles textbook. Uh, so if that's a growth plate there, a type 2 means fracture goes into the growth plate and then goes up this way, into the metaphysis. Okay, and then the opposite occurs with the type 3. Again, the growth plate is here. Fracture goes along the growth plate and then exits into the epiphysis. Now the problem with that is it exits through the articular surface. So now you have a step off, uh, an, an articular fracture with a step off in this particular case. Um, now a type 4 fracture, again growth plate is here. Type 4 fracture, the fracture actually crosses the growth plate. So it goes from the metaphysis through the epiphysis. And then a type 5 fracture is a fracture that you actually may not really see at all. Uh, it is a sort of crush injury of the growth plate that is really only diagnosed in retrospect. This patient has an injury, seems like something's wrong, can't really see anything. 
Um, maybe if you suspect a growth plate, you hope it's a type 1 injury, but then that bone stops growing completely. Uh, and you realize later on, maybe that wasn't a type 1, it was a type 5. Or it wasn't a non-displaced type 1, it was a type 5, and that whole growth plate shut down. So you can imagine, when there's trauma to the growth plate, you can have a problem with the bone growing again. Uh, and that can cause, uh, obviously, shortening of that bone. It could cause asymmetric growth, where, um, like in this bone, uh, it stops growing here, but keeps growing here. So now the bone is going to lengthen and and be something like uh, like so maybe something like that perhaps okay so growth plate fractures are frequently treated with closed management so here's an example of a very displaced type 1 distal radius fracture uh Salter Harris 1 uh treated with uh tr some traction uh and then uh with traction the bone sometimes can just immediately go back in place or with a little bit of force from a thumb uh, can be um, gently pushed back into place. Or if you have an articular fracture, so here's our distal femur, type 3, Salter Harris type 3, uh, let's say it was displaced like in this uh, uh, picture here. Uh, you, it's an articular fracture, so you do not want to have a big step off incongruity at the joint surface. So you set it back in place and you do open reduction internal fixation. Notice how we try not to place screws that go, you know, across the growth plate, right? Because you don't want to just, you know, destroy portions of the growth plate that will no longer, uh, you know, now you'll have this area here stop growing. So uh, when at all possible, you avoid crossing the growth plate. Now, moving on from growth plate injuries, other types of uh, fractures are buckle fractures, right? So here you can see growth plates here, growth plates here. Fracture doesn't involve the growth plate at all. The fracture is here. But what you can see is that there's this buckling, right? And you can see there's sort of this buckling. I like to think of it like almost like... Um, I don't know, if you sit on an empty cardboard box and it buckles out, um, also known as a torus fracture. But this is essentially a fracture with a fairly good prognosis. They usually heal very well. You don't have complete um, instability of the fracture, but it's a fracture. So it does have to be uh, treated. Uh, oftentimes fractures like this will be casted, uh, but you don't want to miss it. Other type of fracture is a green stick fracture. So Here's an example of a minimally angulated green stick fracture. What you can see is that maybe there was a bending force and um, uh, the bone was being bent this way. So there's a tension on this corner here and you can see that this broke under tension. Uh, but the, this cortex here is really intact. It bent a little bit, but it really didn't break. So the term green stick, kind of like if you were to snap a branch right off of a tree that's living, you may get something like that, as opposed to a dead branch that's been sitting around that's brittle and it snaps in half more like a piece of chalk. So green stick fracture. You do not see this in adults typically. And, and part of it is because the bone is a little bit thinner, it's a little bit weaker, and the periosteum is very thick. So all, you know you have this thick, thick periosteal layer that just does not want to snap. And the bone being thinner can actually bend a little bit. Um, so you can get these fracture patterns in kids like buckle fractures and green stick fractures. You can even get plastic deformation where you have here, you can see in the ulna it appears, at least in this case, maybe a bit of a, you know, there's a fracture line here, maybe a green stick fracture here. Um, but then the radius is kind of just bent. I mean, so it just looks a little bit more bowed than usual, and um, so you can get plastic deformation um, in certain bones. So, like I said, growth deformity can occur as a sequelae. So it can happen from a growth plate injury, but it can even happen from fractures that are not in the growth plate. So um, if a fracture just, when it heals, uh, doesn't heal straight or 
uh, causes overgrowth or undergrowth, you can get this deformity. So here you can see a patient had a fracture in the proximal tibia, extra articular, not in the growth plate up there, and it just healed in such a way that it overgrew compared to the fibula. And in this case, now you can see this is getting longer, and now you have this valgus deformity, right? You can see the bone sort of like takes, I'm exaggerating, but sort of takes this angle now, right here. And uh, now you can see in this patient that you sort of have you know, normal alignment here and sort of this valgus alignment here. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, you can kind of see from the clinical appearance what's going on. So, children's fractures can lead to you know, growth plate injuries, uh, growth deformity as a result of that, or even fractures that don't involve the growth plate. And these are not things that you're going to know right away. You're only going to know down the line. You can see this sort of progression of dates here um, over time. And unfortunately, in children, you also have to be on the lookout for non-accidental injuries. Now, this is not the, the same patient. This is a femur here, and this is a humerus on the other side. But, um, you know, unfortunately, when you have an infant and a non-ambulating individual, essentially, coming in with this long, oblique femoral shaft fracture, uh, you have to be a little bit concerned that this is a non-accidental injury. Now, there are rare conditions when this can occur, such as osteogenesis imperfecta, um, but um, in most otherwise normal children, you don't get femoral shaft fractures at that age in non-ambulatory children and an infant. So you have to uh, really be very concerned about uh, this being a, for, uh, a result of child abuse um, and uh, that needs to be reported and investigated. Uh, not investigated by you, but reported by you, investigated by uh, the authorities wherever you're practicing uh, and whatever the, the laws are. Um, a spiral humerus fracture is another example um, in, in a toddler. Um, kind of an unusual fracture to get. Uh, again, these kind of fractures can occur from torsional forces from child abuse. Uh, if you are suspicious, then you really have to do a thorough physical, possibly even a radiologic examination. Now, we, we don't just try to avoid x-raying children more than necessary, right? But on the flip side, if you're worried that you have a potential abuse case, then you do have to look for skull fractures, you do have to look for multiple rib fractures, you do have to look for fractures occurring in various stages of healing. So a patient comes in with a fracture and you get an x-ray of their other limb and it shows a healing fracture and they don't report it, then you have to be worried that this child is incurring multiple injuries over time. You have to look and see are there bruise marks, on the chest um, or any indication of sort of non-accidental bruising and trauma. Uh, and, and it can be difficult and if it's not something you're used to looking for, um, it can be hard and you also don't want to necessarily um, falsely accuse parents who, you know, and those of us who are parents, you know that stuff happens with kids. Uh, but um, there is a fine line and there is an obligation you have and, and, and children are uh, unfortunately victims of child abuse and many times uh, these things are diagnosed uh, um, you know, by physicians and physician assistants in an emergency room for instance. So here are the lecture objectives. Hopefully um, you feel like um, you've accomplished that. If not, maybe go through the reading or the videos again. Uh, you want to understand the assessment and basic management of fractures, understand why some fractures do not heal, understand the complications and associated injuries that present with fractures, and understand some basic principles of pediatric fractures. Thanks.